All right, all right, let's get this thing going here. All right, so let's get going on the first slide. All right, so we are here at the end of a, maybe a long day for everybody on their first full day here. Um, and if you have been to the other cross-plane focus sessions today, you may have seen me now for the third time. You may be getting sick of me by now, but I promise I'm not sick of any of you all. So let's get this third talk here going. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, a success story, basically, is what we're going to be talking about. So streamlining infrastructure with cross-plane and a transformation story on it. All right, so we are going to cover, uh, this is all about uh, Clement's company and his uh, team that he's a platform engineer for, a company called Consensus. We're going to talk about where they started, uh, some of the pain points they had, finding Crossplane and things that they, they were hoping Crossplane can solve for them, and then the journey they took to get to the successful platform that they've built now. Uh, so we'll dive into three key areas of the functionality that they've built, um, and then we'll wrap it up uh, with a conclusion of it all, some of the key lessons, and then a Q&A. All right, so my name is Jared Watts. Um, you know, I am one of the creators of the Crossplane Project. I'm a founding engineer at our startup, Upbound, that created the Crossplane Project. This is my second um, open source uh, CNCF project that I'm a part of. Uh, the other one I've, I've done is the Rook Project. So I love building open source communities. And then also, I kind of split my time in between California and Belgium. Um, one of those has good waves. You can guess which one that might be. And come on. And so as Jared was saying, I've been working at Consensus for the past two years. And uh, I really like creating stuff, and it's not only confined to work. I really like music uh, and photography. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, so a little bit about Consensus. Consensus is a blockchain technology and Web3 software development company. It was founded back in 2016, and we have about uh, 800 employees today. Our main offering uh, are MetaMask, so it's a self-custodial wallet. Self-custodial meaning you're the owner of the key, and the wallet enables you to uh, connect and interact with uh, uh, Web3 application. Then we have Infra. It's a Web3 development platform, so it's a set of API and tooling uh, to develop Web3 application. And our latest offering is Linear, so it's a ZK EVM L2 network. To keep it simple, it's a network that enables scaling on top of Ethereum. So let's talk uh, about a cross-plane journey. So our starting point looked like this. So we will have teams, um, and we had embedded SRE models. So uh, we will work as part of a multiple team. And the environment looked pretty much like this. So we will have uh, a team using Terraform, another one using Ansible with CloudFormation, and a third one using Pulumi. Also, the maturity was quite different across teams. So for example, Team C, they had a dedicated uh, SRE and DevOps, Team B only DevOps, and Team A didn't have anyone. Also, um, the interaction that we had with Team so, is that basically we didn't offer any service. So they would come to us asking, I need a database, I need to scale. And one of the tasks that we had um, was also maintaining what they had. And if there was a vulnerability, well, we needed to patch all of them. And it was quite inefficient because it was uh, deployed in a different way for each team. Also, so the inefficiency that we are seeing is that um, we, having all of the tools, it requires tool-specific knowledge. And so that's quite a learning curve when you arrive in the team. But also working as part of multiple projects is quite a collective load. Also, as we saw, it was mostly human interaction. So over voice, ticket, or message, so it was a little bit inefficient. Also, what we are seeing is that team were reinventing the wheel. So they were solving the same problem, but in a different manner because they didn't use the same uh, tech stack. Also, the main inefficiency was our time to market. As uh, we didn't have an identified way of doing things, uh, it was hard to know how to do it. Also, teams were building for their own projects. So it, have, it was kind of a pet approach, and it was unreasonable uh, for the company. So our plan was pretty simple. Have a platform approach, so that mostly consists of having golden path and having self-service. How did you want to do it? Well, pretty easy, leverage Kubernetes, and for the simple reason that it has a lot of benefits. So it has uh, an extension model with the API. It also uh, supports versioning by, de by design, and we have discovery of the APIs. Also, Kubernetes has a great isolation model with namespace. 
and um, authentication with its airbag. Also, what's interesting in Kubernetes is the reconciliation model. To, to offer the conception of our platform, well, we wanted to do something pretty simple at first, so we could use Argo CD. What did we want to target first? Well, new projects and very simple ones, so stateless first. So if you wanted to do this before crossplane, um, so before joining consensus, I was working at Federal and we had built uh, this whole uh, platform on top of Kubernetes and automated the life cycle for developers. So we would have operators managing registry on, let's say, Artifactory and Secret Store on Vault, and we had built all those operators. So this was quite a high learning curve because we needed to learn Go, a little bit of the Kubernetes internal, and it was uh, quite challenging to, to manage. Also, those kind of components um, were kind of specific purpose built. We did open source some of those operators, but there were some specificities to our environment, and so they, it wasn't really portable. We'll pass it back All to right. Enjoy. Yeah. So we've got an idea about where Clement's team, they, you know, the problems they had, they, you know, starting their journey and trying to attack some of these problems, and we're, you know, running into some issues and some challenges with those, right? So this is when you start looking at the Crossplane project and start seeing a couple of its different focus areas and how those are going to help the journey that his team has started on, right? So the very first thing we're going to look at here is that, um, you know, Crossplane is it's a framework. It allows you to build your own platform without writing code, right? We just saw in the last slide that his team started writing custom operators and, you know, having right controllers and all this sort of stuff, right? That's more software to maintain, more complexity, right? And so a better approach for a lot of scenarios is to simply be able to declaratively describe what you want the platform to do. Not write the code, the, you know, imperative code that uh, tell, you know, instructs like line by line what to do, but just describe the situation you want to get to. Let Crossplane deal with all of the provisioning, managing, reconciliation, all that stuff, right? Um, now, you can go past that of, you know, I can, you can imagine some scenarios where declaratively specifying what you want Crossplane to do isn't going to cover exactly what you want. So, you know, you can go beyond that and start writing a little bit of code, uh, custom code specific to your platform's needs uh, with the new, fe new feature, feature in Crossplane uh, called Composition Functions. Um, but, you know, you can do a lot with just a declarative approach. So beyond that, though, we also we need to look at how Crossplane is an API-first design, similar to Kubernetes itself, right? Uh, where you know you as the platform engineer can codify your golden paths. Like this is how we do infrastructure at Consensus. You can codify that into Crossplane resources, and then you can enable your developers to self-service to get that infrastructure on demand when they need it. But the golden path has been kind of captured somewhere, right? So it's that separation of concerns with what the platform engineer needs to deal with and what the developers are faced with, with the, you know, the simple abstractions that you expose to them. And then once we, you know, we're all with API-first design, we're all using the same, speaking the same language, then we can integrate really nicely with the rest of the tools in the Kubernetes ecosystem, and we're taking a consistent approach with applications and infrastructure. And then you, know, you have similar experiences across those, like label matching and things like that. All right, so some people may have seen some of this stuff today, but a quick refresher for people that aren't super aware of the composition model in Crossplane is that, right, it's got this idea of composing together multiple resources into a simplified abstraction that your developers get to, you know, use themselves, right? So our developer here on the left side of the graph, uh, she's going to just be able to create a simple claim, like, I want some sort of infrastructure resource, then underneath the covers, you know, a cross-plane composition that you, the platform engineer, authored will specify specifically these are the resources that compose that uh, high-level abstraction that the developer is asking for. To make that more tangible, we can look at an example where, you know, the developer, all they're going to have to worry about is, yes, I have a deployment and a service and whatever for my app. I also need Postgres. So in the same way that I'm creating my app, my deployments, my container stuff, I'm going to be also create a Postgres instance that is a simple example of an abstraction of a platform API that the platform engineer has cobbled together, composed together over time. Right? So that small Postgres instance that the developer needs to deal with, something very simple, 
underneath the covers. We see here that that means the, the platform engineer has made a composition for AWS that that means an RDS database, the you know, database parameter group, security group, all that sort of stuff. It could be AWS, it could be GCP, Azure, whatever. Uh, but the developer is faced with a simple model, a simple abstraction of Postgres, and then all the golden paths, the configuration, the organizational policy, all that stuff is under the covers, underneath the API line. So to give you a rough idea, on how we made progress on this. So this is the timeline. So we started back in August 22. Uh, we were POCing uh, on AWS. And in parallel, we also started internal discovery. So we talked uh, with all the stakeholders across the company, and we wanted to better understand their needs and how we could support them. Uh, back in December, we had written some documents and were requesting comment across the company. And we started developing the, the MVP. Then in March, we had our first version of the platform. So really easy, uh, so we onboarded our, our first client, and it was a very easy application. So we just had the Kubernetes cluster and a registry to deploy the, the application. And so that was deployed to, to production. Um, and then we started adding more and more resources uh, so to support stateful application. So we added support for RDS, for S3 Bucket, uh, for mail service, SCS, and key management with uh, KMS. And then in June, we deployed our first uh, stateful application to, to production. After this, we started the development of, um, of additional resources for blockchain workload. Uh, blockchain workload are a bit uh, more complicated in the sense that you need uh, to customize a bit the dot group, have access to storage class, auto scaling, and have some caching, for example, with Redis or MCache. And then in September, we had a POC of uh, running blockchain node on the platform and we also started um, the development of a UI and a backstage integration, because I think there are some very interesting synergy between backstage and, and crossplane. So now let's talk about one of the key features that we've built into the platform, which is multi-tenancy. So the idea is that we have this uh, single control plane uh, that will hold the, the composition, so that's our automation. And then we'll use namespace uh, that will represent the different environment that we have. Um, and so the, those claims um, will take the composition from, from the cluster. Also, we wanted to have a one-to-one -on -one, one -one relation uh, with our cloud provider account, so that when a claim is inside a namespace, it corresponds directly to a cloud account. How did we do this? We are building a provider uh, config reference inside our composition. So if you look on the right, we have our claim inside the namespace, team A dev, and as part of our composition, we are patching from the name uh, of the namespace of the claim to the provider config ref on the managed resource. And so that's how we are selecting the appropriate provider config for this namespace. Um, a nice advantage of this is that you have control over the naming convention. And, and this, is, um, this make it easier for our user, um, and for also for us for troubleshooting purposes to have naming on those resources. So if you look on, on the left, we have our claim as part of a namespace, and inside our composition, what we'll do is that we are gonna patch the metadata name uh, of our managed resources, and we are gonna use the namespace and the name of the claim to build uh, that name. Also keep in mind that if you are using um, managed resources as part of other uh, composition, you might have conflict. So you can, for example, prefix with the XRD name or the composition name if you want to avoid conflicts. So now let's look at how we manage all of this. So surprise, we use Crossplane to manage our tenant system. So we have this cluster scope resource because we want to have uniqueness of tenants inside our control plane. And so on the right, what you see is the managed manage resources that we generate for, for this tenant resource. So we're gonna create a management space. So it's not for the user, it's only for, for us. Then we're also uh, creating an observability tenant. So before starting this platform, we had deployed an observability platform using LGTM. So Loki, Mimir, Grafana, and Tempo. And we build a, a custom provider to be able to create a tenant to that platform or retrieve exist existing credential if the tenant already existed. Also, what we are doing as part of creating this tenant is that we deploy Argo CD instance so that teams can um, right away consume the platform. Um, 
Uh, and lastly, what we are creating is subdomain uh, and certificates, so that when teams deploy a cluster, they can expose their application without any further configuration. Once we have created this uh, tenant, we're able to claim environments. So that's why we didn't have a namespace uh, on the tenant, but now we have a, the, the team A uh, namespace. And this environment here, yeah, let's call it dev. So what do we do as part of this composition? We are creating a namespace, and this one is going to be where the user will consume the platform. Also, we are building the provider config to access uh, the right uh, AWS account, and we are kind of doing the, a baseline on the account, so creating roles, policies, collecting to YDCs. And finally, what we are doing is that we are configuring Argo CD projects. So if we take a, take a step back, it pretty much looks like this. So on the left, we have our management API, and on the, and on the right, we have the consumption. Now let's talk a little bit more about our Argo CD isolation. So as I said, the tenant is creating an Argo CD instance, and then the environment is going to create projects. Project is the isolation mechanism uh, within Argo. And we, we are creating two different kind of projects. So one is for infrastructure resources, and the other one is for the workload. Um, and so now let's see uh, the difference between those two. Let's check the first one uh, on, on the left, the infra one. So if we look at it, the destination is going to be in cluster, because it's going to contact the control plane. And we are going to um, uh, patch the namespace uh, um, with the corresponding tenant and environment. So basically, it's going to be the namespace dedicated to the, the user. Also, so this is the control plane, so we don't allow any uh, cluster scope resources to be provisioned, but we do allow some namespace resources. And this is going to be kind of the uh, catalog that we offer uh, as part of our um, infrastructure API. So let's say we have a Kubernetes cluster and S3 bucket. Now, if we look at the other one, at the uh, application project, the destination is going to be everything except the control plane. And then we're going to blacklist some of the admin namespace on the workload cluster that we manage. So for example, let's say kubesystem, kubenodelis. Um, again, we don't allow any uh, cluster scope resources, but once they created a namespace, uh, developer are kind of admin inside that namespace. They can uh, provision any resources. So now let's talk about the second feature that we implemented, which is claim reference. What do I mean by this? So let's say I created a cluster, um, and now I want to create a database and connect this database uh, to the cluster. So if you, if you look at the SQL instance claim, uh, the spec uh, has a cluster field, and the demo is going to be the metadata name of the corresponding cluster that we want to connect. If you see, in the cluster, we have a spec region defined, but not only in the SQL instance. And we're going to select the appropriate region based on the cluster. Also, what we are doing is that we are connecting the DB to the cluster VPC using label matching. And finally, we are generating credential or a service account binding in the workload cluster so that developer can access the, well, an application can access the database. If we take this uh, a step further, this is what it could potentially look like for, for our application. So the starting point will be uh, the, the cluster on the top left, and then we have an API to define uh, namespaces. So it's going to reference a cluster um, to deploy a namespace, and then we're also able to, uh, developer are also able to deploy service account, so as part of a namespace, and then this service account is going to be used by other resources uh, to give permission to access uh, the, the resource. So what I didn't show you previously is that the SQL instance, it reference a cluster, but you can also reference a service account to give the permission. Uh, for resources that don't need a direct attachment at the network level, or that can be connected to multiple workloads, like a bucket, we implemented a, a resource that we call service account binding. And this one is going to take as an input the reference of the bucket and the reference of the service account. And so having this, our service account will be able to access both the database and the S3 bucket. Also, we have uh, kind of an extension model for Kubernetes. So for example, uh, developers are able to configure additional uh, storage class if they want. 
All right, so we're about to talk uh, about a particular part of the Clemence platform here that uses heavily the feature uh, called environment config within Crossplane. So I wanted to kind of take a step back and talk about that feature and what it's meant to solve. So the environment config feature is, um, you know, it is a good way, like a good way to think about it is that it provides runtime information to your Crossplane compositions. So you can like, write a single composition and then you'll know, have it run in different environments with different environmental context, different environmental information, like you know, the dev environment, staging environment, production environment, whatever it may be. Um, and you know, that single composition can behave differently because of this environmental input that's coming into it. So what it looks like is it's kind of like Crossplane's version of a config map. You know, it allows uh, arbitrary, unstructured data, key value pairs, that kind of stuff, right? Um, so it's a way to stash information from wherever you need to so that Crossplane compositions can access it and manipulate it and all that sort of stuff. Um, so there's two big scenarios to think about here in which, um, you know, sources of data going into an environment config. One of those is going to be from things outside of Crossplane entirely, so external data sources and systems. Uh, a common one to make that more tangible is like, uh, you know, your CI CD system, um, GitOps, that type of thing. Your CD system could, uh, as part of deploying things to the control plane, it could deploy an environment config with information about that particular dev or product, you know, prod environment, whatever it is there. Um, and then another one that we're going to see a specific example from the consensus platform is uh, within compositions themselves. Uh, a composition can write, uh, you know, generating resources, it can be writing information about them, status and data and stuff like that, write that to an environment config, and then later on a totally different composition can use that information from the environment config, so it's a bit of a, it's a way to share data across compositions as well. Um, this feature has been around for a little bit. It's, uh, we first released it as an alpha feature in 1.11, um, which was back in January, so we're coming up on a year now. Uh, one thing we didn't expect to happen was how many people were gonna start using it. We released an alpha feature and people started putting it in production um, pretty quickly, so it's very popular. Uh, and we have a bit of work cut out for ourselves in the 1.15 milestone that we're working on just as of this week to mature it to beta and make sure that it fits the right shape for the, the usage it really needs and the right API. Um, so if you have feedback about the composition uh, environments, environment config stuff, there's a SIG, a special interest group for it. We encourage you to join that on the Crossplane Slack uh, because this is the time to get that feedback in before we continue maturing the feature. All right, so now let's look at how we build the, the reference system. So uh, as part of our composition, we are gonna create both the managed resources, let's say if we have an next cluster resources, so this is our cluster automation, and so we are gonna um, have managed resources to create this cluster, and also have, as part of the composition, we are gonna have this environment config. And so if you, if you look at the patch and the claim resources that we have, um, basically it's gonna, it's gonna copy some of the, some of the field there. Um, so as part of the environment config, the data that which we are interested on is the, um, uh, the data that we are gonna reuse as part of other composition. So that could be, for example, the account ID that we needed to template some policies, the region, we saw it in the case of the database, or IDC endpoints uh, that's used, I think, for the, ex, the service account uh, that we have. Also, what we are adding um, uh, as label um, is the, the corresponding namespace and the cluster. Why do we have this? It's to be able to retrieve the environment config as part of another composition. So this is our SQL instance, and if you look at the configuration that we have as part of our, config, uh, or, or, as part of our composition, is a selector. The selector is gonna use a match label, and so we, it's pretty easy. We're passing the namespace and the spec cluster that will correspond to the name of the cluster to select the appropriate uh, environment config. Now, let's talk about uh, cluster components. So we, we, we talked about uh, Argo CD, uh, but the tenant instance, so that's the bottom one that you see. We didn't talk about the Argo CD instance that you have at the top, uh, that is the one that is gonna manage our control pane. Um, and so in the middle, you have the namespaces that are representing our different environments. What happens when a, a cluster is created as part of those um, tenants is that it's gonna be both added to our Argo CD instance in the control plane and to the tenant instance. So the tenant instance is gonna be so that user can deploy workload to their cluster and the control plane one is gonna be to manage uh, cluster components. 
So how does our cluster component work? Let's start on the bottom. So we have a claim, um, and uh, this will generate the next cluster. And as part of our composition, we have a cluster manage resources um, that is part of the Argo CD provider. And this is going to manage the cluster um, that uh, live inside Argo CD. And then inside Argo CD, so there is this concept of uh, application set. An application set will generate uh, application based on the cluster that we have. So we have kind of this um, uh, dynamic behavior. When cluster are added, it's going to uh, generate a new application for, for that cluster. And then finally, so the application is going to sync back to the cluster corresponding to the claim. So, so we do uh, manage some admin components um, that are installed by default on the cluster, but we also uh, have an add-on mechanism if teams um, want to have additional uh, components. So if you look at our claim on the left, we have an add-on field with, uh, for example, downscaler. Uh, that's uh, a controller that we use uh, to turn off workload on the weekend. Um, and so we have a true or false value. And as part of our cluster composition, this is going to get passed down uh, to the uh, cluster Argo CD resources, and this is going to be set up as a label on the cluster. Uh, we do this because as part of uh, uh, Argo CD application set, uh, you can use the uh, generator cluster and select cluster based on those labels. So for example, if we define, when we defined our uh, downscaler deployment, um, we say that we want to match uh, the downscaler equal true uh, label. And what's really nice with this is that if they change the value, it's going to uh, remove the application. Also, what's pretty nice is that you can use the uh, default value of the XRD. So, for example, we didn't define the reloader uh, add-on on our claim, but the default value is false, so, the uh, so it was added to the um, cluster label. Also, you can do uh, more complex than Boolean, and for example, we also have an autoscaler field uh, with Carpenter. And for example, uh, you could implement different uh, cluster autoscaler uh, for, your, for your clusters. All right. All right. So we have seen a bunch of details about the platform that Consensus built and uh, you know, the success story with it. So that was a lot of like, the practical you know, specifics and technical details. So let's hop back up to wrap this session up today with a you know, high level conclusions out of this. right? So we saw that Consensus was struggling when they had a different sort of uh, you know, infrastructure and platform approach for each one of the teams. So you, to be successful, you've, you've got to take a consistent approach and have a consistent platform story for, uh, that works for all of your teams. right? Um, another thing I think we saw that was really, really interesting is that uh, you know, they took an approach of a unified single control plane that can, it's multi-tenant, right? So it can handle the needs of all the environments for all the teams uh, and these you know, sub-environments for each team too, like production and staging and all that stuff, right? Um, so that is really nice to kind of consolidate and have a single control plane consistent experience that's dealing with everything your teams, uh, your organization needs, but you'd have to take the right approach with multi-tenancy so you've got the proper isolation and things are set up correctly, right? Uh, we also saw that you know, a platform will not scale unless you are taking the time to automate and codify what the golden paths are. You, know, you define that this is the way that our organization does infrastructure, and you capture that, you codify it, you get it in a repeatable pattern so that the, your development teams, new teams, new environments, all that sort of stuff can take advantage of those golden paths and self-service and get those when they need it. Um, and obviously that requires automation, right? If you have a human in the loop there, that's going to slow things down, that's going to get, you know, go back to the days of you know, days or weeks for provisioning new environments as opposed to minutes. Um, and then finally, you know, we, as we see time and time again, if you so kind of standardize on the Kubernetes API, everyone's speaking the same language, all the tools play really nicely together, and you get a simple, like, consistent story across all of those as well. All right, so I think we've got, so that, this thing says 35 minutes, but I don't think that's correct, uh, like five minutes for questions. So if anybody has Q&A, there's a microphone right there, and we'll be happy to answer everything for you. You've popped up real quick, go for it. Yeah, um, so one of the things about the multi-tenant approach that you have, how do you manage a situation where a dev team wants to deploy some kind of operator that would deploy a cluster level resource? Do they have their own cluster, and in their tenant Argo CD, they can deploy that? And like, I guess if the answer is they can do whatever they want, 
then what are you specifically managing in the control plane Argo CD? That oh no, they, they cannot do whatever they want. They, they won't be able to install a cluster component. Uh, they, they don't have the permission. So they cannot create cluster scope resources on this cluster. So what we will do is implement it for them. And so now it's available to the whole company. Gotcha. OK, so you give them a way to self-service that operator into their yeah. environment. Yeah, right. Thank you. No Great problem. talk. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm new to Crossplane. Only really saw any of it today. Um, I was curious about um, the environment config that you were discussing. Uh, you said it was a lot like a config map, and then when we saw it, like, it actually just looks like a config map. So why is that not just a config map? Or I've seen other tools where they say uh, leverage this from config map or from secret. And so wh why have your own? Which because it seems like if I wanted to have values that maybe I would propagate to another service, uh, having it in the environment config makes it not able to do that. Uh, yeah, so, so one of the biggest reasons for driving that design is because when we, when we first had the idea of, hey, we want to populate cross-plane compositions and you know, cross-plane things uh, with data from arbitrary places, right? That was the driving like, use case for the functionality of environment config. And so the very first thing was like, okay, cool, so we'll teach it, you know, we'll just let you use config maps and you know, we'll just teach the composition machinery how to talk to config maps and blah, blah, blah. But a problem that that brings up is that uh, you know, the multi-tenancy story and the RBAC model for crossplane is that, um, you know, if you, teach, if you let a, a composition or you let uh, composition authors uh, access arbitrary data and you start, like, Kubernetes resources, like config maps or secrets and stuff like that, you very quickly run into a problem of, oh, wait, they can access any config map or we have to lock this down in some sort of way. So it, the decision to have a strong type, a crossplane specific type for the environment config, was based around, uh, like largely driven by security of, okay, it'll be a crossplane specific type, and as opposed to your compositions being able to access any config map and, uh, throughout your cluster and goes spelunking around, it's just a crossplane specific stuff uh, that was you know, kind of designed to be part of the platform and access through compositions. So that was the driving factor. That makes sense. Uh, as a follow up, then, is there a mechanism to export some of the values if you wanted to? like chain this together with another tool that would read from a config map? Yeah, and, yeah, and that's, that's a great question because that exactly speeds back to like, it's all uh, Kubernetes API stuff, and it's you know, any tool can read an environment config. It doesn't have to know specifically what it is. It's got a data field and then you know, unstructured data or key values underneath that. So anything, you know, Kube control could go plunk, plunk down into it. You know, anything that talks Kubernetes API can access it as well. So it integrates nicely with the ecosystem, even though it is a custom resource that is cross-plane sp specific, it still integrates nicely everywhere. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's really funny. The uh, <clears throat> at my company, we kind of built the same thing. I just gave a very similar talk to my internal teams like a week ago about this very same flow. Um, so I, I see a lot of same ideas. I'm glad I'm not the only one that thought of them because that makes me a little bit smarter, I guess. Um, <laughs> but the uh, the good thing, uh, you know, I really I really like the environment configs and everything. I guess my one question I have is: Have you run into any scaling issues? Um, that's one of the things I've been kind of worried about, uh, and just the lack of being able to kind of like deploy multiple controllers to control the like different namespaces. It's been a little bit of lacking on the cross-plane side. So for now, we don't have a huge number of resources. I think we have about 10 or 15 clusters across, uh, I guess, seven tenants, and that's about 1,500 managed resources. So it's not huge, um, but still, it uses quite uh, s uh, some uh, resources. Uh, but maybe Jared can talk a little bit uh, more about uh, the optimization that uh, they are currently uh, doing. Yeah, so I think that there are, historically in Crossplane, there have been places where you run into scale issues. Uh, the biggest one that we ran head into, like really badly, was uh, around the number of CRDs. Because Crossplane, you teach Crossplane how to manage anything. So Amazon itself has like 900 uh, you know, resources, right? And so that created an enormous problem for us uh, because the scalability thresholds of Crossplane, uh, sorry, of Kubernetes in general, they thought through a number of things like number of resources, number of pods, number of nodes, like all those are well documented and well understood. Number of CRDs was not part of that focus or not part of that list. So you started, you know, it's like, cool, I'm going to teach it how to, you know, Amazon and, and, and Google and Alibaba and like the, the control plane would fall on its head because there are too many CRDs and the processing of them and all to get them exposed as endpoints in the API server was just not efficient enough to handle that. 
So we did a number of things uh, in upstream Kubernetes to kind of deal with some of those inefficiencies and make that a better process. But then we also took an approach in crossplane of, uh, of um, the sharding. Yeah, like yeah. You have exactly, provider families, right, to separate those out so that you can just pick, pick a scoped set of uh, resources that you want to deal with that are important to you and not bring in you know, thousands of them all at once. So that was a major scaling issue that has largely been solved now. Yeah, the, uh, the families are pretty cool. I've been using them. Uh, I guess the only uh, thing I would like to see maybe out of the crossplane in the future is be able to kind of like namespace some of the providers uh, so they, the same CRD, but have more control over what they're operating on so I can kind of give some guarantees about what controller, you know, instead of having one controller fight over all of the CR across the entire cluster. Anyway, oh, thank yes, you, yes, great talk. And one last thing is that in the provider AWS, there is a lot of ongoing work on the resource utilization. So the interaction with Terraform right now is through the CLI, and what they are doing, I think there was an alpha about a week ago, uh, to interact directly with the API, and so they are seeing a lot of uh, uh, stability and, uh, and you know, not stability, but it's much more efficient and uh, faster to reconcile uh, on the on this new uh, version. And I think it should be available in a, in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. 1.15 or 1.14? Uh, no, so it's not tied to the cross-plane release. Uh, it's part of the uh, provider release. So it's um, yeah. So out of band, it's not. Yeah, it'll be before 115, I think. Um, sweet. So that's all the time we had in the session here. So we'll wrap it up. Thanks everybody for coming. But I think you know, we'll probably stick around and you know hang out a bit if you want to come up. Thank you. Thanks, dude. Thanks. Thanks.